Hello, everybody. So much fun to see the Breakline community come together for this chat with Manny Medina. Manny, thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted to have you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to help. So, um, so Manny, I want to just jump right into it. And folks, Manny and um, and his family just welcomed a uh, a new baby girl, and so he is going to have to hop off a little early today um, to go be a dad. So we're especially lucky that he carved out time to be with us. So, um, so Manny, I wanted to kind of jump right into your story. You are the co-founder and CEO of Outreach, which is one of the sort of buzziest unicorn, you know, status startups on the West Coast. But you started out um, as a kid in Ecuador. You moved to the U.S. to complete your, your bachelor's, your college degree. And you're really proud and you're outspoken about your experience as an immigrant. Um, you talk about it very publicly. You have your port of entry listed on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, and I I actually want to kind of start the conversation there and just sort of um, your experience as an immigrant and the pride that you derive from that experience and maybe some of the superpowers that um, that you feel that it gave you in terms of starting and building this company. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's a very it's a very personal thing. But as I as I uh, connect with more people, I, I notice that it's a uh, it's a it's a community thing. It's a it's a thing that many people can relate, um, and and it, and it sort of like expands uh, where you're from, it expands where your parents are from, and, and that gives you a sense of pride, right? So it, especially in this land of, of mixed races, where everybody has you know a little bit of mom, a little bit of dad, um, and and I I affect that in all ways in my life. So there's a few things that make me proud. So first of all is that you know. Everything Ecuador was is a it's a great country and I, I appreciate everything that happened to me there, but I don't think I could have done anything that I did here there. So I'm always appreciative of how much America gives me. So I feel involved and I feel committed in a way that you know the pig is involved in breakfast as opposed to the chicken is involved in breakfast. So very involved. I'm very committed. And um and I also am very committed to the fact that there's many others like me, and it could be you know you yourself, or it could be your parents who got you here, that that are what make this country and this society what it is. And because of that, I want to make sure that everybody not only hears my story, but finds some inspiration and some part of themselves in my own story. So I grew up in Ecuador, and I did not grow up you know wealthy. I grew up sort of like lower middle class. Um, my um, my parents, you know, my parents didn't have anything to do with me during the summer, so they would send me to my, uh, my stepmoms had a sister who had a shrimp farm. And so I would go and help out in the shrimp farm. And the, and the shrimp farm, um, they're not, they're, I, don't, I don't see them here because nobody's from farm shrimp anymore. Usually, you, you know, you want, the, uh, you want the stuff that is caught out, out in sea, but, you know, I have to farm it. And it's, it's hot. Right, it's 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 a lot of barren land with pools full of shrimp that you have to feed every day. So you have to like get in the little dinghy and like sort of feed the shrimp, and then you only harvest the shrimp at night uh, when it's cold because otherwise the shrimp would, would you know would uh would go bad. Um, and that work was hard work, and it taught me a lot of things about grit, and it also sort of created a new bottom for me. So when I came and became an entrepreneur, I always think about you know as bad as it gets, it will never be as bad. As hard as the shrimp in the middle of the night, like it's always better, right? And 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 that sort of like perspective of of you know how how good we have it here, how much opportunity we have it here, I sort of bring with me, and it's what allows me to give my co-founders, um, you know, energy and optimism. Um, it also made me realize that you know I have my I have three other co-founders, and they're all a white and b you know ten years younger than I am, but it's because I'm different than them. That we ended up where we were you know many times you know they will aggregate around an idea because of their own you know history or their own sort of upbringing and i will and i will come out of the same idea from a completely different point of view and that enrichment and that discussion and that frankness and that openness created a better outcome and created the ability for us to sort of you know go down with the ship with the first company and research like a phoenix of the second company and, and every time we bring somebody else new into the company, I always think of adding to this stew of flavors and everybody brings their own flavor and, and the flavor makes it, the whole soup more magnificent because of it. And I always feel that 
that's my contribution to this country, to society in general, is that I am, you know, helping out, you know, you know, make this soup of the U.S. is, you know, grand experiment and, you know, democracy a little bit better than it was before. So, like, I, I take it with pride. I, 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 I feel that um, all immigrants of all sorts uh, make this place better. Um, and if it's not you, your parents did. And if it wasn't your parents, your grandparents did. And you know, and you know, just happy to be here. Mm -hmm. And um, many, there's so many different places where I want to take the conversation, but I do think that you are known for having a really progressive philosophy around hiring and team building. And that's partly informed by your personal experience as an immigrant. So for example, Outreach decided not to ask for um, citizenship status or visa status as part of its interview process. And as a result, you all um, maybe punched above your weight in terms of being able to hire data scientists and other deeply technical folks. Um, because they were attracted to the team that you were building at Outreach. But it even goes beyond that. You told a story about finding top talent in unusual places. You found a really senior sales executive from T-Mobile, which is not what um, sort of conventional wisdom would have said, you know, in terms of hunting ground for a great salesperson. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your philosophy with regard to team building and, and the folks that you're kind of um, putting, you know, adding, adding to this, this company that, that is taking off like a rocket ship? What are you looking for and what are you thinking about with regard to building that team? You know, that's a great question because it made me, uh, you know, it's something I think about a lot is the fact that when I came to this country, my first instinct is I need to blend in. I need to be like the rest. I need to try to, you know, try to be as, as you know, Northern New Jersey as I can, right? Um, and, and I worked really hard on that. And then I realized that that's not me. And, and not only that's not me, but I can't lead life not being me. Because, you know, me is me. Me has all these attributes. Me is loud. You know, me is technical. Me is inspiring, short temper. Like there's all these things about me that makes me me. And I can't lead life that way. That way. And, and and um and that led me to the next thought when I when I went to um when I got admitted into 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 into, into HBS, um, that being different is actually a superpower because it's really hard to be different. You know, many people try to bucket you into like, oh, you are, you know, you're a, you know you're a Latino, a Latino, or you are X, or you are you know a technical guy. And I realized that I, I was a bunch of incongruities, right? Like I was, I was a Latino that was good at math. That shit doesn't compute, right? Like I'm supposed to be, you know, my, my, you know, helping somebody's garden or running a taco truck, but instead, like I'm really deep into, into computer science and that's my thing. But that's, that was, you know, so once I got, uh, you know, comfortable and that took me a while because I, I didn't even get into this country when I was 21. And you're, when you're a male, you're 21, you really don't know what you're doing. So it took me about a few years to sort of like, you know, finding myself and once i found out that being different is important then i found out that a team of different people is actually a superpower too so that's when i set out to start you know that, to develop my own philosophy of building teams and and it was much later in life that i read uh team of teams by uh team of rivals by uh which is a biography of lincoln and that just brought it together that was like oh my god there was a you know one of the most celebrated presidents had the same thesis around building teams and that was, that was eye-opening for me. And then I set out to, to go down this vein of like, how do you build, you know, not complementary teams, but teams that have like, if you think of vectors, that teams that are in completely different directions with completely different superpowers. And then my job is to develop a superpower. How do you bring them together? How do you harness that energy that is going in all directions in such a way that you unify and become, and become sort of like a lightning strike? And that's, a, and that's an art and that's a science and that's a strength. And that's what I work on every day. So when you ask me as a CEO, what do you do? I wake up every morning and be like, I'm gonna be better at harnessing this desperate set of you know, high-performing individuals into a unified, into a unified mission that actually delivers. So, you know, my my you know, what, what advice from here to you is, is is to like lean into that difference. That difference makes you memorable, that difference makes you important. If you blend into the rest of the pile or you you know, slip into becoming something that everybody else is then you just got to be in a bucket of things. Whereas if you were your, your own asset class, you know, where you have to be considered separately because you don't look like anybody else, you don't act like anybody else, you're, in, you're an incongruency, 
you're memorable. And memorable is important in this day and age. So be memorable. Mm -hmm. I love that, Manny. And you were talking about sort of the power of bringing together a team that has different skill sets, different perspectives, and what we can kind of achieve together when, when we're in that scenario. And that's been important for you at multiple points along the way in, in your career and in your trajectory. But one of the most crucial moments, one of the most pivotal moments was when the company that was the predecessor to Outreach, you and your three co-founders were three years in and that yep. company was failing. You had about a month of cash left. There was a month of payroll left. Your teammates were um, cataloging computers and stuff to sell on eBay to pay those final invoices. I mean, it was really close to the end. And you had a Hail Mary moment where you kind of pulled everyone back from the brink. Can you talk to us about that set of circumstances? What, what brought you to that moment and the insight that you had that led to the path forward? Um, the, 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 the insight, so the, the moment developed as we were, you know, we didn't make payroll in December and, and that's when we realized that, oh my God, you know, we actually don't have that much money in the bank and we owe the lawyers more than we had in the bank and we were paying ourselves very little. Um, and you know, my team was getting very nervous, but I, I lean in on the fact that in their heart of hearts, this is what they wanted to be doing. And in my heart of hearts, this is what I wanted to be doing. Now, I think that we were working on the wrong problem. And that's why we were not getting paid. And we never found, you know, strong product market fit. And that's why we were, you know, sort of floundering. But if, I, if we can only work on a better problem, if we can only have a better product market fit, that would solve, solve the problems, right? But I did have one asset. So I didn't have product market fit. I didn't have any cash in the bank. Um, and I didn't have a, a, you know, and I and I and I didn't have enough momentum to go raise. Like at this point, I was branded a failure. And Silicon Valley, which is you know where we raise our our, our funds, is very um, it's very Silicon Valley. Like it's very like momentum based. Like if you're winning, you're killing and you're crushing, and then you pour a fuel in the fire, and everybody will throw the money at you. But when you're not, everybody will not return your calls. So the um, the, the insight that I have was that. There's a lot of things we didn't have, but we did have one thing that nobody else has that was super important. I had a team that was committed, that went through hell and back, and they were willing to work together and do it again. And you asked me this question before you already joined, is where you find your energy. Um, I find my energy in, in, in solving problems and working with each other, and my team found their energy in being with each other. You know, Despite all of this crap and despite like all being down, et cetera, they were willing to give it another go. And that gave me a lot of energy. So. You know, we sort of like started looking into into what are the things that our customers do like about us. Like, what are the you know what are the other problems that we haven't looked at because we were so busy trying to solve this one problem, and we found one, and we found one in communications. And we say, look, if we just build a communication workflow, I think we can sell this. And so we started working on that path, and it wasn't like you know, we came up with a different idea and everything just you know, you know was a walk in the park. Like we came up with a different idea, and that idea didn't work. And then we came up with a different idea, and that idea didn't work. And then we came up with a working idea, and then implementation didn't work. And then I remember like the, the second strong pivot for us was this one night when my, my co-founders, um, you know, get in a room and they, and they call me because uh, I, was, I was trying to sell stuff in California and they, and they were like, hey, Manny, like the, the implementation is not going to work, but I, I have a good idea of one that will work, but I need two months. And I'm like, we don't have two months. We have one month of cash in the back. Like, what are we going to do? And then at that point, you know, you know, you get a good night's nice sleep, get a, you know, a good run in the morning. And I said that I'm like, I'm just going to raise enough funds to keep us alive until the product works. And then you, and that became my sole goal for, you know, the first two months and then the third month and then the fifth month, et cetera. So I became really good at separating people from, you know, five, 10, 15, $20,000. And then I became so good at doing that at scale. I could be in a room full of you and I will make you part with a thousand grand, at least half of this trip, even if you don't have it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really good at that. But that developed over time, right? And that confidence of doing it developed over time. So I got really good at walking in, doing a quick pitch and then saying, hey, do you want to make an entry? Because I'm, I'm looking for customers. And that person will make an entry. And then you start playing the, the social network of like, if I convince a friend of investing, I get two for one. You see what I mean? And then that person opens up two or three doors more. And then all of a sudden I had, I was swimming in meetings for fundraising to the point that by the time we raised our institutional round, I got, 
at least 50 meetings already set up with people who wanted to give me money that I had to go cancel because already, you know, raise a couple million dollars. So the, the whole um, psychology of, 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 of winning is self-imposed. You can convince yourself that you're winning despite anything around you. And then evidence shows up little by little and you use that to fuel your next book and to reinforce your own psychology that you're in the right, that you're in the right path. And then you do it again and then you do it again. And then before you know, you're good at it. But it's no free lunch. It's all, it's all work. But it starts with convincing yourself that you're going to do it and it's going to be okay. So... Manny, I love that. I love that story so much. I'm really interested as we were talking about earlier, so many of the founders and CEOs who come and speak in the speaker series have just had a face plant, you know, at some point in their careers before they started their current company. And, um, and as I'm looking at the, the break liners who I can see in this screen, I'm seeing people who have pushed past really painful moments and failures in their own careers. And I'm really interested in that grit, you know, that you kind of dig into to get past that moment. Because as you said, other people could brand you prematurely as a failure. You talked about, you know, investors saying, eh, that, that guy, Manny, it's over. You know, he's a has-been, he's a failure. But you found the way to push past it. Yeah. Um, once you realize that there is a lot of fish in the ocean, then you forget about what people are branding you because that's always a subset of people. You can always talk to more people. Mm -hmm. And that was a beautiful thing about racing from individuals is that there is, you know, there is a couple million people in San Francisco about which, you know, at least 20,000 of them can write you a $10,000 check. Mm -hmm. Think about that. 20,000 of them can write you a $10,000 check. That's $20 million I'll ever get to go collect. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once you put the math in your favor, then it's an execution problem. You see what I mean? You know, how mm -hmm. much are you going to be the, the vote of your time to go get it done? You know what I mean? How many meetings are you going to set up? And then you break down the problem into little things, right? Like I set a goal of making a hundred calls a day. So I, of course you didn't hit it the first time, right? But you know, by the time I was two weeks into it, I was a I was a hundred calls a day, you know, for a couple of days. And then, and then you make a goal of like making, you know, of getting at least, you know, 10 meetings a day. And then, and then you hit that goal. And by the way, that's not a lot of calls. Our reps made somewhere between 90 and 120 calls a day. So it's not, it's not a lot. It's just a lot of dedication, a lot of, a lot of process. You have, to, you have to put your mind to it and you will get it done. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, once you hit five, you know, once you hit five meetings a day, then you hit seven meetings a day, then you hit 10 meetings a day. And then out of every meeting a day, you have to get good at asking for cash. That's really hard. You know, the number one differentiator in the good entrepreneurs and bad entrepreneurs is the ones who don't ask for the money. So if you're not good at asking for wiring instructions, do not start a company. <laughs> so straight up, drop out, you know, save yourself the next half hour and go to something else. Because that you will have to do. It. And you will have to convince somebody else to invest in you on an idea or something that is not quite there yet, but that they have to see your vision. Manny, what, what I love about that, that comment is the granularity. You have to ask for the wire instructions. And you believe in granularity. You believe in getting your hands dirty and really understanding every single function in your company. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, the insight that you that you have gleaned by working just about every job in the company. Yeah, you know, I, I only learn by doing. I, I, you know, a, a lot of people sort of have all their superpowers. I have to get into it and ask for the details, et cetera. And I'm blessed that my co-founders, again, who come from a different point of view, they, they will always ask me detailed questions about stuff. So they will never get, let me get away with, with BS. Um, and, and the second thing is that, um, so a little bit about me. So my, my family, um, my grandfather uh, was very committed to the Socialist Party in Italy. So I come from sort of like, you know, a very, very left-leaning kind of family, right? My, my, grand, my, my dad was educated in Cuba. Um, and, and so I have a lot of those tendencies, right? So I see the frontline worker in my company as the most important asset in the organization. Those, like the entire Jenga edifice has some pieces you kind of move and those are the customer facing reps. You know, whether you're doing support, where you're doing sales, or you're doing customer success, whatever it is. If you're talking to the customer, you are presenting the brand, you're presenting the culture, you are sort of like the sum of the parts that is talking to a customer. So I never feel satisfied of just assuming that I know how my customer is feeling. 
And because of this need to know, like I have this imperative, like moral imperative to know what's going on. Like I sit in it. And it actually, it also makes a point. So for instance, I don't have an office, I have a chair. And I have this busted out chair that looks awful. It looks like it was pulled out of the Goodwill because it was. And it stands out among this sea of like, you know, you know, um, highly ergonomic, you know, thousand dollar chair, but my chair is all busted up. So I move my chair because people know what my chair looks like. It's brown, it's ugly. And I put it in an area where I'm going to sit. I usually sit in the pits. I sit in the pit of support. I sit in the pit of inside sales. I sit in the pit of customer success. So I can listen in. And I really learn a lot just by listening in and what's going on with the customer, what's going on in that interaction. How is that rep being on board? How's that rep feeling? Is that rep confident when they talk to the customer? Is a customer success, is a customer support confident when answering the question? Are we empowering them with the right information? You find out so much information when you're close to the action that you will never find out by sitting in a glass you know, door office. And that's sort of how I, how I that's I, just how I run things. Manny, one thing that I think is really interesting about you is that you're a computer scientist. You have a master's in computer science. Um, but you also led sales for the company and you led fundraising. I mean, you were responsible for bringing cash into the business in one way or another. Um, and I love sales as a path for breakliners for a whole bunch of different reasons. Will you talk about what you love about it? Um, all right, let me, let me do the first bit. There's no fastest way to riches than software sales. There's no fastest way to riches than software sales. Everybody's buying software. Software, will be, they, just so you know, the cloud, the cloud will be a $10 trillion business in about five years. So if all you do is you drop out of here and go sell something related to the cloud, you will make money because there's no other way to not make money in that business. Somebody will buy it and you will make a commission on that. It's a 15% to 20% commission on every dollar that you sell and, and everybody's buying cloud. So. If you want to go do that and make money, that's your path. Uh, any other path, um, I'm, I'm not sure how it works, but this one does pay out. All right, with that out of the way, um, why do I love sales? I think I learned, I read a book back when I was trying to you know, get in the company on the ground. I think it was called uh, Sales. Um, so there's a couple of books. One was, um, Jesus, what was the name of that book? Of course, I'm drawing a blank right now when I got put on the spot. Um, I read a, a book about sales that I, I, will, I will email to you when I'm done, that equated sales to, be, to being a doctor. In a doctor, you have a duty of delivering uh, a cure, of making somebody better. Not everybody will want to get better, by the way. People will believe that, like you see out there, you know, people will believe that the vaccine will kill you. People will believe that they don't need it, et cetera. But your duty as a doctor is to convince that individual of getting better, getting well with the medicine that you're providing. And assuming that you work at a company in which you believe the product and you believe the, the, the promise of the product, then your job, your duty, your goal is to go put it in the customer's hands because you will solve a problem. You see what I mean? So the best salespeople are those who are constantly consulting. They have bottomless curiosity about other people's businesses. And they, and they fundamentally believe that they can solve their problems with whatever that they're selling. Now, not everybody is like that. And I'm sure that there is a lot of people who are peddling other stuff that is not helpful. But if you believe in what you're selling and you're genuinely curious about your customer's problems, sales is, a, is the best way to you know, make a great life and have fun. Mm -hmm. And Manny, in this conversation, you're, you have so much energy and dynamism. And in a way it comes across as being bulletproof. Like nothing is gonna take Manny Medina down. Um, but you're actually well known for leading with a lot of vulnerability and a lot of transparency. So outreach shares the highs and lows of every week. And you write a really heartfelt email to the entire team every week about what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Will you talk a little bit about sort of bringing more vulnerability to the workplace? Um, I think that People will only trust you if they see the full human being. And trust is a predecessor to faith. I mean, you can have faith on something you don't trust. So you have to trust someone. And then only then you can, you can be sold a vision, right? Because faith, I think this is 
Hebrews 11. It's like, you know, they, they, they believe in things unseen, right? So you have to believe in something that doesn't exist for you to actually have faith, but without trust, nothing is, is there. So, um, you know, if, if I'm not vulnerable and super open about what are my shortcomings, what are the things that I'm afraid of, what are the things that I, you know, what are my blanks and my soft spots, um, you know, it will be hard to get to people to trust me. Now, it, it's especially important for me, right? Because I come across like this all the time, right? There is no other Manny. This is a Manny that shows up everywhere, right? So some, to some people, it's a little like, well, that's a lot. I mean, you know, I can only take you, you know, in a little bit at a time. But this is me, right? I cannot be me. So I need to bring this other aspect of like, you know, these are all, all the other things that, you know, I'm not so sure about. Um, and I also feel that vulnerability brings confidence. And vulnerability inspires others to be vulnerable. And that actually makes for an honest conversation. And, and, and an honest conversation feeds into my impatience. Because if I have to break down through your facade and through all the pain that, of your seniority or whatever your experience is, et cetera, that's, I just don't have time for that. So I'd rather just be honest and open and vulnerable by showing you how I am open and honest and vulnerable and give you license to do it. That just makes, it just makes it easier and faster to work and, and more fun. So I, I don't know why you wouldn't do it. Mm hmm. And you, um, so for those of you who haven't followed Manny on LinkedIn, you should, and he posts a lot and I encourage you to read, um, this, the topics that he writes about one of your recent articles was around imposter syndrome. And, you know, there's of course a link there to vulnerability. And you were talking about how you've decided to use imposter syndrome as your fuel. Um, you said you, you don't try to destroy it, um, but you try to use it to fuel yourself to continue pushing forward. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means to you? Um, yeah, so, you know, imposter syndrome, I feel like it has been the thing that held me back for a very long time. You know, a lot of people ask me, whether you start to start a company at age 40, you know, most entrepreneurs start at 25, because, you know, who am I, a kid from Ecuador who has no more experience than a shrimp farming? you know, to start a company. And that held me back for a long time. And that was, that was, that was rough. And, um, you know, when you stop with that, you know, when I came to this country, I had, I still have an accent, but I had a thicker accent. And I, I had to ask people to repeat themselves, et cetera. And people thought I was dumb, right? And people were like, instead of saying the same thing a little slower, they would say the same thing louder. Like I was deaf, right? And I would have to deal with that stuff for, for a while. And, and that sort of like kept me, kept me cagey, kept me sort of guarded, et cetera. Um, and, and so owning those experiences, so, you know, I think it was Satya Nadella who said that, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of where you end up is path dependent, you know, you end up where you're, you're where you are because you took a particular path to, to get to where you are and you're either going to find strength or weaknesses in your, in your path, right? You can say, oh my God, like I am who I am because, you know, I got here through this thing and for me, et cetera, you can just say like this, this informs my strength, but it also informs my weaknesses. And, and it, again, it's part of being, you know, being vulnerable that allows me to then be open about the fact that, you know, every day I show up is the biggest, the biggest job of my life. Every day at outreach is the biggest job I ever have. So if the board ever comes to me and tells me we need to find someone more experienced, I'm like, that's not me, because I don't have more experience than what I have in right now. <laughs> you know, I'm already operating at the peak capacity. So, but owning that and being, you know, secure in that, in the, in that, in that knowledge makes you more aware. It also makes you, you know, um, that it gives you that better ability to not drink your own Kool-Aid. A lot of the CEOs when they're doing well, you know, believe a lot of their own narratives and you need the ability to succeed in life. You need the ability to be open to other narratives that are counter to yours because you will be wrong. It's kind of like a motorcycle. It's when you fall, not if you fall. So you will be wrong. And the question is, will you be open and, and humble enough to catch it before it makes you wrong? Mm -hmm. I, I love that point of you need to be open to other narratives than the, the dominant one in your head at any one time, because the reverse can also be true. We can, we can sometimes be running those negative narratives and we need to be open to the fact that we have greatness in us that we just haven't realized yet. Yeah. Um, okay, so our break liner, Al Kim has a question. He says, in your looking back on 2019 LinkedIn article, 
you wrote that your principal job is to make others on the team great. And you referenced General McChrystal. What does caring look like in your role as a gardener? Um, the number one role of a gardener is pulling out the weeds. Is to pull out the stuff that is around greatness, to let greatness continue to grow and lit, and pull out the stuff that is sucking the nutrients out of the ground and not giving you any yield. So a lot of times you're just going around being like, so this is one of the things that I actually, I learned about Warren Buffett does this too. And I try to keep my calendar as less busy as possible. So I can walk around and be of service to other people in my team. You know what I mean? Not, nothing, nothing empowers a sales rep more than me coming to them and being like, what deal do you need help with? A CEO going to a rep saying, how can I help you in a deal? That is super empowering. And if I get a couple of those a day, you know, I win. The rep wins, the company wins, you know? If I go to the support team and I tell them, look, is there a ticket that was hard? Can I help you with that? You want me to communicate with a customer? It's just brighten somebody's day. And I learn a lot. So the, the ability to the ability to, to sort of walking around and making sure that the, the plants are getting nourishment and flourishing and getting enough sun and getting enough and getting enough attention and pulling all the weeds around it is by far the number one job and the most inspiring job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was sort of like changing that narrative again of, of, of the leadership of being like the, the person in front and like leading the charge and blah, 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 as opposed to being the one that gardens, that hires the right plants, puts them in the right space, gives them the right nutrition and walks around just pulling weeds every morning to make sure that they're growing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maya has a question for you, Manny. She says, it looks like you've gotten comfortable leaning into your differences and turning those into strengths. How did you flip the switch? Um, I, I don't think there was a, a, a switch to flip per se. You, you, just, you know, you, you, you try things and see how people react. Um, you know, and then you see, and, 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 and then you see how you feel about it. The, the, um, I'm just trying to, to figure out how to answer the question. So I think that, um, you know, I, a lot of, I was telling my team the other day that I work really well with narratives. So what is the narrative that you tell yourself about yourself? And do you like that narrative? Can you live with a narrative? And then you tell that narrative to others and do they like the narrative or can they live with the narrative? Um, and eventually you start incorporating in the narratives more things about yourself that you didn't think that could come out, right? So I speak at Unleash, which is our biggest conference. Last Unleash had about 2,000 people. Do you think I was born comfortable speaking in English in front of 2,000 people? I, I wasn't. And when I hear my, and one of the problems, one of the things about you know, public speaking is you have to rehearse a lot for many months and you have to hear yourself rehearsing a lot for many months. I hate my own accent sometimes. You know what I mean? Because I like I want to be perfect in, in you know communicating in, in the US, but I'm not. So I changed my narrative now like look the accent makes you different. The accent makes you exciting the accent makes you memorable. You know, lean into the accent. You know every once in a while actually mangle a word to get people on their edge. And then when by switching that narrative all of a sudden I was like I'm gonna be really good at this. I'm gonna own this public speaking. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make Unleash the next Tony Robbins event. It's gonna be amazing, right? So it's a lot about like the own narrative that you have on you and then you flip the narrative to own something that you didn't know you can own and all of a sudden, boom, it flowers, right? It blossoms. Mm -hmm. And Manny Javeria has a question. She says, I'm assuming the amazing growth of outreach was unexpected. Where do you see the company in three to five years? Um, oh, you know, we're just getting started. Um, so just to give context, so we sell to, we sell sales engagement, a sales engagement platform. We sell them in seats, meaning you have to buy a seat of outreach and you pay per month uh, on a yearly subscription. There is 30 million sales reps in the world. We have about 120,000 of them. Our competitors combined have another 100,000 of them. So the total is about 250,000 of them. So we have less than 1% of the market. So every day I wake up and be like, how do I even get to 1% of the market? 1% of the market will be 3 million seats. That's a lot of seats. So that's what I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Manny, as you, as we, we wrap up, we, we know you have to get back to your newborn baby. And we're here with our community, many of whom are coming from underselected backgrounds and have their eye on tech. Final parting words, wisdom that you'd like to leave them with as they either begin or transition into these new careers. Uh, number one is be curious. I remember my first interview at Amazon. I, I, I didn't do so well on the interview, on the first interview. This is the one that the dude that ended up calling me Manny. Um, and as opposed to Manuel, which was is my real name. So you kind of call me Manny, the interview kind of went so so. And then I'm like, you know, I'm really gonna understand about Amazon. I'm gonna read everything about Amazon. I read every single 10K before my next batch of interviews. And not because out of duty or, you know, because I wanted to be prepared and I'm the type A, whatever. I just, out of curiosity, like, like how does Amazon make money? That's where I learned about the flywheel. That's when I learned so many things that are kind of like hidden in those 10Ks that do not come forward in the interview. And just owning that curiosity, letting that curiosity sort of like pull you into something really made me a better, a better, a better employee once I joined Amazon, but a better interviewer once I got into it. Because the, the goal of every interview conversation is to talk shop. The moment you're talking shop, is one professional to another. Right, it stops being an interview up to like well, your character and things you have done, et cetera, et cetera. But like becomes this this exchange, you know, of two professionals who are in the foxhole together, sort of like trying to trying to solve a problem. So, but for you to own the right to talk shop, you really need to be knowledgeable. To be knowledgeable, you need to be curious. So be curious. Be genuinely curious about somebody else's problem. Number two is to lean into your difference. You know, we all get to see a lot of resumes. We all get to see a lot of but the, the memorable ones are the ones that sticks in your mind. If you're not memorable, you're not winning because nobody will remember you. So be memorable and, and just care. Bring your energy. You know, you know one, of the, one, one of the points of differentiation is, is how well will you remember after you're gone, right? It's, it's like Maya and you lose it. Most people will forget what you said, but everybody will remember how you made them feel. So make that a goal, make other people feel good and you will win.